This is Space Time, Series 22, Episode 17. Coming up on Space Time, Japan's Hayabusa 2 touches down on the asteroid Ryugu, Israel's first mission on its way to the moon, and Richard Branson says he expects to be flying to space by July. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Japan's Hayabusa 2 spacecraft has briefly touched down on the surface of the asteroid Ryugu to collect samples for eventual return to Earth. The spacecraft first fired a small projectile into the asteroid's surface to loosen material, and then briefly landed at the impact site to collect the asteroidal rocks and soil. 1621-73 Ryugu is a potentially hazardous near- or near-Earth object, belonging to the Apollo group of Earth-crossing asteroids. The 950-metre-wide diamond-shaped space rock is a rare type of asteroid known as a spectral type CG. It includes properties of both common carbonaceous or high-carbon C-type asteroids, as well as relatively rare G-type asteroids, which contain strong ultraviolet absorption features, suggesting phyllosilicate minerals such as clays or mica. Ryugu orbits the Sun in retrograde, that is, in the opposite direction of the planets, at a distance of between 0.96 and 1.41 astronomical units every 474 Earth days. An astronomical unit being the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, about 150 million kilometres or 8 light minutes. As for the name Ryugu, well it's Japanese for Dragon Palace and it refers to a magical underwater palace in Japanese folklore where a fisherman travelled on the back of a turtle, returning home later with a mysterious box, much like Hayabusa 2 returning with asteroid samples. The Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency JAXA is now waiting for confirmation that Hayabusa's sample collection was successful. If it gets the OK, it'll only be the second time in history that a spacecraft has collected a sample from an asteroid. Hayabusa 2's predecessor, the original Hayabusa, undertook a similar operation during its mission to the asteroid Itakawa back in 2005. However, it collected only a few grains of dust following a series of problems during the first descent attempt and a projectile firing failure during the second attempt. However, those precious few grains were successfully returned to Earth, being ejected in a special sample return capsule which parachuted down into the Woomera rocket range in outback South Australia in 2010. Hayabusa 2's autonomous descent to the surface of Ryugu has also been considered a high-risk manoeuvre, taking 26 hours to slowly drop the spacecraft from an altitude of about 20 kilometres down onto a desolate grey boulder-strewn surface which could easily damage the spacecraft. But mission managers believe that based on everything they can see, the descent and sample collection went according to plan this time round. Hayabusa 2 locked onto a previously positioned reflective target marker, a region chosen by scientists as the safest place on the rock-covered asteroid to attempt the landing. The spacecraft then fired a projectile into the surface just as it was touching down, kicking up some soil, pebbles and rocky material, which would then have been quickly scooped into a sample collection chamber. The Hayabusa 2 orbiter is scheduled to depart Ryugu in December, swooping past the Earth a year later, where it will eject a sample return capsule, which, like its predecessor, is designed to parachute down into the warmer rocket range in outback South Australia. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. Israel's Genesis Lunar Lander has been successfully launched on the first leg of its journey to the surface of the Moon. The spacecraft was flown into orbit aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket, which blasted off from Space Launch Complex 40 at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. If successful, Israel will become only the fourth nation on Earth after the Soviet Union, the United States and China to undertake the 384,000 kilometer journey to land on the lunar surface. It's a big moment. Uh, we are really excited. We're sure that you are also. So one thing we always do in every event is uh, we take a selfie. Three, two, 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 one, two, one, to the moon! What we have done is we've used our ingenuity and we will achieve the objective 
and we will show the world what we in Israel can do. This lander will be the world's first privately funded spacecraft to reach the moon. Its mission is to transmit photos and video of its new home and conduct tests of the environment. An interesting fact about this lander is that it will be using its own power to travel to the moon, which will take nearly two months. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Ignition. So at T plus 47 seconds into flight, everything is looking nominal. We're currently preparing to throttle down as we enter max Q. Vehicle supersonic. Vehicle has reached maximum aerodynamic pressure. So there you just heard we passed through max Q. We'll now throttle back up. MVAC engine chill. There you heard the call out for MVAC engine chill. This is the point in which we start to flow the super cold liquid oxygen into the turbo pumps, bringing them down to flight temperatures. This helps us reduce the temperature difference between the liquid oxygen and the hardware. Everything looking good with stage one trajectory. Main engine cutoff, Miko 1, approaching now. Miko. Second stage engine has lit the gorgeous red orange glow of that nozzle. We're now at T plus three minutes and five seconds into flight. Coming up next will be fairing deployment. Now that second stage is in the vacuum of space, uh, we don't need the fairing anymore. So in order to improve our vehicle efficiency, we shed the extra weight. Fairing separation confirmed. Stage one entry startup. And their entry burn has begun. This should last about 18 seconds. Stage one entry burn. Shut down. And entry burn is complete for first stage. Next, coming up at about T plus eight minutes will be a rapid series of events. This will include the first second stage engine cutoff, or SECA-1, the start of the landing burn, followed by the first stage landing. SECA-1 and the landing burn will occur within four seconds of each other, followed by the stage one landing shortly after that. Stage one landing startup. We have SECA-1. Stage one landing will deploy. Despite the challenging conditions there. And we also got confirmation of stage two in good orbit. And right about now, the engine will cut off. And when the time comes that Israel has landed on the moon, and the time comes that the world begins to use the moon as a launching pad for exploration in space, they will remember the contribution that we have made. This is our contribution to mankind. We are coming up on our first deployment of the night, the Space IL Lunar Lander. Space IL spacecraft separation confirmed. And we've got confirmation of separation. Separation confirmed. A successful deployment of the Space IL Lunar Lander, a first non-governmental lander to make its way to the moon. The 585-kilogram Genesis lander, Be'ashit in Hebrew, was successfully deployed into orbit 35 minutes after launch, igniting its own onboard rocket engine for the first of several times, designed to progressively increase its orbital apogee, or furthest distance from the Earth, until its orbit's so large it encompasses the moon as well. Using orbital raising instead of direct lunar transfer maneuver has become the preferred way of reaching the moon for robotic missions because it uses less fuel. But it takes about seven weeks rather than just three days with a direct lunar transfer. Once its orbit includes that of the moon, the spacecraft undertakes a lunar orbit insertion, going into orbit around the moon for between two and four weeks before eventually landing on the Mare Serenitatis, or Sea of Serenity, a dark, massive 674-kilometre-wide basaltic lunar basin located just east of the Mare Ibrium and between the landing sites of the Apollo 15 and 17 missions. Once on the lunar surface, Genesis will send back images and use its magnetometer to study the lunar magnetic field in order to help scientists better understand how it formed. 
It'll also deploy a laser retroreflector array to the lunar surface for NASA as part of a new lunar-based navigational system for spacecraft visiting the moon. NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter should also be in position to document the spacecraft's descent and landing. And NASA's Deep Space Communications Network will provide telemetry and communications for mission managers in Tel Aviv. As well as its scientific payload, Genesis is also carrying a digital time capsule known as the Arc Lunar Library, which contains over 30 million pages of data and millions of documents from around the world, including dictionaries in multiple languages, as well as encyclopedias, and a full copy of the English language Wikipedia, a copy of the Judeo-Christian Bible, examples of fine literature and art, as well as children's drawings, the diaries of a Holocaust survivor, Israel's national anthem, the Hatikva, an Israeli flag, and a copy of the Israeli Declaration of Independence. Built by Israeli Aerospace Industries and Space IL, Genesis was originally designed to compete for the Google Lunar X Prize to become the first privately built spacecraft to travel to and land on the lunar surface. While the Lunar X Prize was eventually called off when no one met the time limits, Space IL decided to continue with the project. Space AL was founded as a non-profit organization designed to promote scientific and technological education. As Genesis rockets towards the moon, India is now planning to become the fifth lunar nation. It'll launch its Chandrayaan-2 mission to place a lander and rover on the moon's surface later this year, and Japan is planning its own mission for either next year or 2021. Meanwhile, NASA is also looking at returning the United States to the lunar surface later this year, and detailed planning is continuing on the Gateway Lunar Space Station project, which could be operational by 2026. As well as the Genesis spacecraft, the SpaceX mission also carried two other payloads, including the U.S. Air Force Research Laboratory S-5 spacecraft and Indonesia's first high-throughput telecommunications satellite, the PSN-6 Nusantara Sat-2. Both were successfully deployed 45 minutes after launch before separating into their separate orbits. The 60 kg Space Situational Awareness S-5 spacecraft is an experimental U.S. Air Force micro-satellite designed to detect and locate near geosynchronous orbital space objects for routine and frequent updates of the geocatalog. Meanwhile, Indonesia's 4,100 kg space systems Laurel-built PSN-6 is equipped with 26 high-throughput and 12 extended C-band transponders, as well as 18 high-throughput KU-band transponders, all designed to improve telecommunications and internet services across the Indonesian archipelago. This mission was the third flight for the same Falcon 9 booster, which had already flown the Iridium-7 mission last July and Argentina's SEOCOM 1A Earth Observation Satellite mission 11 weeks later. The booster returned to Earth following Mika or main engine cutoff and first aid separation, successfully landing on the drone ship Of Course I Still Love You, which had been pre-positioned in the North Atlantic Ocean downrange of the launch site. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Sydney has always been Australia's party city, and next to its New Year's Eve fireworks celebrations, the biggest party on the Harbour City's calendar is its annual Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras Festival. As part of this year's celebrations, Australia's National Science Agency, the CSIRO, has lit up its iconic Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder radio telescope in a rainbow of colours. Six of the 12-metre dishes located in the remote Western Australian outback are now each displaying a different colour of the rainbow against the backdrop of the Milky Way to mark the CSIRO's inaugural participation in this year's Mardi Gras parade. At least 50 CSIRO staff will march in the parade on March the 2nd holding a giant DNA double helix celebrating the organisation's commitment to diversity. The theme being diversity is in our DNA. Dr. Sarah Pearce, Deputy Director of CSIRO Astronomy and Space Sciences, says using the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder was appropriate because it points to the future of space research. The Pathfinder, located at the Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory, some 800 kilometres north of Perth, is testing technologies which will be incorporated into the massive multi-billion dollar Square Kilometre Array project, the world's largest radio telescope, now being developed in outback Australia and in South Africa. 
Pierce says the Pathfinder is used by a diverse group of astronomers from right around the world, so it's an appropriate setting for a rainbow display. We've lit up six of our cap dishes um, in rainbow colours, one colour per dish. And we've done that to demonstrate really our commitment to diversity, to celebrate that we're walking at Mardi Gras. And also because the users of our telescope are really diverse and we want to demonstrate to them as well that we're inclusive and welcoming to everybody. How important is diversity in an organisation as, as large and well diverse itself as the CSIRO? I mean, you have fingers in so many pies from astronomy through to marine sciences, geology through to engineering. Yeah, look, absolutely, Stuart. Um, so CSIRO does a really wide range of science and in order to attract and retain really the best talent internationally I think we have to be you know very welcoming people have to be comfortable able to bring their whole best selves to work and there's also a lot of evidence that suggests that diverse teams are more innovative and they make more revenue and they're more effective with ASCAP how's that going where are we up to with that? ASCAP's in its commissioning phase now, so it's 36 dishes and its innovative radio cameras are all starting to work together. But it's already delivered some really great science. For example, we've detected more than 20 fast radio bursts already with the telescope, even though it's not quite fully working yet. And of course, the, the good thing with ASCAP is you haven't got microwave ovens there to accidentally open up before they've finished cooking, so you're not getting any false readings. No, in fact, ASCAP, we think, is on what's the world's best radio observatory site because it's extremely quiet. It's around 350 kilometres from the nearest town and so that's why we've gone there because it's very radio quiet. Are you near the Murchison Wildfield Array? Is that, uh, is that nearby? Yes, that's right. So we're both, both on the Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory which is managed by CSIRO and we're very pleased to be able to share it with, with MWA. Murchison's a different type of radio telescope set up, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. So Murchison Wildfield Array is a low frequency telescope and it and ASCAP are both precursors for the Square Kilometre Array, which will also be at the same site um, when it gets built in Australia in a couple of years. Now, Meerkat's already up and running the early stages of that for the Square Kilometre Array. What about the Australian side of things? Yes, so we've been um, running our precursors now. As I say, ASCAP's nearly nearly um, up and running and MWA's been running for a number of years. But we've also been working on the design for the telescope. And what we've learned from ASCAP and MWA will be feeding into the SKA design. The two functions of what's being built in Australia and what's being built in South Africa, you're looking at different ends of the electromagnetic radio spectrum, aren't you? One's looking at low frequency radio waves and one's looking at mid frequency radio waves. Yeah, that's right. So they'll be complementary. And what happens then once you collect that data? Somehow there's going to be an awful lot of data to try and process and determine what you want and what you chuck out and, and what you keep. And how do you do all that? And where do you store it? And how do you simply get that amount? out of data from one place to another. Yeah, look, ASCAP and SKA to come are absolutely data radio telescopes. You know, they're producing masses more data than we've been used to as radio astronomers. SKA will have an archive that's something like two or three hundred petabytes of data a year. So solving that big data challenge is one of the key things we'll be working on over the next few years. Yeah, that, that's the big problem, isn't it? How do you know what you keep is worth keeping and how do you know what you chuck out is stuff that you can afford to get rid of or you can afford to lose. Yeah and so that's a really key challenge and for the first time with these telescopes the computers the supercomputers that run the data are really part of the telescope because we have to process the data more or less at the same time as it's taken we just can't afford to store all the raw data anymore. In this case we're talking about a new generation of supercomputers some of the biggest in the world. Yeah that's right look we'll require for SKA exoscale kind of computing so that would be those will be bigger computers than anybody has now. Fortunately, we've got a few years yet to get there. And this is all being coordinated from Manchester, England? Yes, so SKA headquarters is in Manchester, but there are 10 member countries all over the world, and we really very much enjoy that international collaboration. In fact, in two weeks' time, we'll be gathering in Rome to sign the treaty for SKA. That's Dr. Sarah Pierce, Deputy Director of CSIRO Astronomy and Space Science. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Virgin Galactic boss Richard Branson says he now expects to be flying to space aboard Spaceship 2 VSS Unity by July this year. Branson's announcement follows December's successful test flight by Unity, which reached an altitude of 82.704 kilometres 
That's 271,340 feet, just short of the 100 kilometre or 328,000 feet altitude internationally recognised as the official start of space. However, the achievement does surpass the lower American recognition for the start of space, which is just 80 kilometres above sea level. The Unity Wing space plane was launched from beneath its twin fuselage White Knight 2 mothership Eve, which had taken off earlier like any conventional jet from the runway at the Mojave Air and Spaceport in California. After climbing to an altitude of 12 kilometres or 40,000 feet, Eve released Unity, which then ignited its hybrid rocket engine and accelerated vertically towards space. Branson says he wants to fly aboard Unity in time to mark the 50th anniversary of the first man on the moon landing, when Apollo 11 astronauts Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin touched down on the Sea of Tranquility on the lunar surface on July 20, 1969. Once operational, Unity will carry two pilots and up to six space tourists at a time on ballistic suborbital flights to the edge of space, providing passengers with a few minutes of microgravity and spectacular views of the Earth beneath before gently gliding back to the ground for a conventional runway landing. Virgin is one of two companies planning to offer suborbital space flights for tourists. The other is Blue Origin, and they've got a bit of an advantage. They've already reached the 100km mark, the official start of space, on eight test flights, a feat Virgin is yet to do. Virgin, of course, suffered a major setback back in 2014 when Unity's predecessor, the VSS Enterprise, broke apart in mid-air following pilot error, killing one of the test pilots. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. The Australian government has released an independent interim assessment of the recent fish deaths in the Murray-Darling River system. The report suggests continued hot conditions combined with the lack of water flow caused water holes to form different layers in the water column, an upper oxygenated layer and a lower layer lacking oxygen. Fish and algae became concentrated in the upper layer. Then, sudden reductions in air temperature and increased wind associated with storms caused the layers to mix resulting in lower oxygen throughout the water column and no escape for the fish. The report claims this was the primary cause of the mass fish deaths. University of Queensland Professor John Quiggin says the report clearly describes the antecedent conditions which made the lower darling so vulnerable to large-scale fish deaths, all of which reflect policy failures of government. These include increased upstream extractive use of water, the decision to release water from the Indy Lakes in 2016, and the extreme climatic conditions which are the new normal as a direct result of climate change. Professor Colin Brown from Macquarie University says if government and managers had factored climate change into the basin plan, as any sensible manager would do, they would have anticipated these extreme events and increased environmental water allocations accordingly. Professor Brown warns that extremely hot days will increase in frequency in the future because of climate change and will soon become the norm. Scientists have announced finding what many consider to be the holy grail of bee discoveries, Wallace's giant bee. This bee is the world's largest, with a wingspan of more than 6 centimetres. But despite its conspicuous size, it's been lost to science since 1981. Now, researchers from the University of Sydney, St Mary's University in Canada, Princeton University and the Global Wildlife Conservation have rediscovered the species in the North Malaccas, an island group in the Indonesian archipelago. The finding resurrects the hope that more of the region's forests still harbour this very rare species. A new study warns that influenza vaccines may not be effective for some elderly people. A report in the journal Cell Press warns that senior citizens are less capable of producing antibodies that can adapt to new viral strains. Scientists say that as people age, their B cells and the antibodies they release have fewer mutations, making their immune systems less flexible and unable to protect against viruses that mutate. The new findings could be used to try and develop vaccines that better protect the elderly against the ever-changing flu virus. The genome of the commonly cultivated strawberry has revealed that it's related to four different types of wild strawberries and that it likely had its origins in North America more than a million years ago. Unlike the two sets in humans, the commonly farmed strawberry has eight sets of chromosomes, making it very complicated at a DNA level. The report in the journal Nature Genetics found the eight sets of chromosomes could be traced back to four wild strawberry ancestors. 
The complicated DNA combinations that can arise from having eight sets of chromosomes were also found to be dominated by just one of these ancestors, whose genes largely control disease resistance and the pathways that give rise to strawberry flavor, color, and aroma. Researchers say this new information will boost breeding efforts. Apple says it plans to increase its push into augmented reality with next year's iPhone to include a more powerful 3D camera designed to scan the environment and create a three-dimensional reconstruction of the real world. The company is also looking at releasing at least two new iPads this year, a new cheaper iPad mini and an iPad with a 10-inch screen and faster processor. Apple says an upgraded iPad Pro is also on the cards for 2020. A new study has found that just like people, Dogs' personalities can change over time. We all know that when dog parents spend extra time scratching their puppies' tummies, taking their dogs out for walkies and games of fetch, or even when they feel constant frustration over their dog's naughty chewing or digging habits, they are gradually shaping their dog's personalities. Like people, dogs have moods and personality traits that shape how they react in certain situations. When people go through big changes in life, their personality traits can change. Now, a report in the Journal of Research and Personality has found this also happens with dogs, and to a surprisingly large degree. While you might expect dogs' personality to be fairly stable, because, let's face it, they don't have the wild lifestyle swings and changes humans do, their personalities actually change quite a lot. Researchers surveyed owners of more than 1,600 dogs, including 50 different breeds, ranging from puppies just a few weeks old to old-timers 15 years of age. They found that saying you can't teach an old dog new tricks really is true, with older dogs being generally harder to train. Apparently, the sweet spot for teaching a dog obedience is around the age of six, by which time it's outgrown its excitable puppy stage, but before it's too set in its ways to change. The researchers also found that dogs really do resemble their owners, at least in personality, with extroverted humans usually having more excitable and active dogs. Owners with high negative emotions tend to have dogs that are more fearful, active, and less responsive to training, while people who rated themselves as agreeable tended to have dogs that are also less fearful and less aggressive to both people and other animals. And owners who felt happiest about their relationship with their dogs tended to report active and excitable dogs, as well as dogs who were the most responsive to training. The findings all show how much power humans have of influencing a dog's personality. It also shows how a dog's personality changes in response to its owner's personality. All a clear case of nurture winning over nature. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Times also broadcast coast to coast across the United States on Science 360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.